Hi, my name is Sarah Pang and I represent Singapore on the WTA. Um, my story is an anomaly on how I reached and I started professional tennis. I started at 19 with the dream of one day being, playing the WTA and everyone told me I was crazy or it was impossible. And prior to playing or picking up tennis actually, I played badminton for 10 years as a competitive junior. And what I did in, as a junior, I did basically in another, another sport. And when I picked up tennis at 19, um, having come from a very traditional uh, Chinese conservative family, uh, I was told that I was crazy, <laughs> as most parents would for, for children in my age and my era, and, and basically told to go to university and get my degree out. With the pact of one day, you know, having done that part, coming out and doing whatever I wanted to do, I had to get my base up. So I, I held on to my end of the bargain and I finished not three but four years with a conscious decision to, to do honours. Uh, I majored in English Literature at the National University of Singapore. Uh, finished my honours year and then after that came out and I still really wanted to play tennis at the highest level, level possible. So 95 to 98 percent of the players on tour are actually independently uh, run entities. They are funded by sponsors or by, you know, fa their families for most parts. And to have my family tell me, you know, Sarah, like you're on your own. You want to play professional tennis at 19? Go do it yourself. Actually, no, I was 23 because I just finished university. It was it was very tough. I had no money, no connections, no knowledge, and no leads on how to embark on this journey. So I dug deep inside myself and I think a lot of what motivated my my course was um, recognizing that there are actually very few things in life that can make you feel like you were made to do them. And for me, uh, no matter how far you can veer from that calling that's in your life, you'll always come back to it. And for me, it's always been in sport. And so after I finished university uh, with the English literature, um, paper to my name, uh, I had to think of a way to earn money to support my tour or my, my, my progress as a tennis player to pay for tennis lessons. And part of that was motivated by a dear Mexican friend of mine that I actually met at one of the tournaments in Singapore. I saw him playing and, you know, finding hitting partners and practice partners is also very one big, big aspect of becoming a better tennis player. And so I saw him playing and I, I went up to him and I said, hello, my name is Sarah and, and would you like to practice with me sometime? And that started the, the beginnings of a, of a friendship. And he, he, coming from Mexico, obviously had a, a lot more um, enthusiastic an environment when it came to professional sport. And he advised me, you know, Sarah, if you really want to, to pursue this path, you need to put yourself in an environment where people can see where they can see whether you have talent or not. If you really want to play professional tennis, go and search out the best coaches in the world and ask them for their two cents worth. So that's how I found my way to Spain. Um, and, and I had intended uh, from three jobs, saving for a year and taking two loans, I intended to stay there for, for three weeks. And three weeks turned into three months, and the end of that time was the verdict. Yeah, Sarah, if you want to play professional tennis, you, you can, but you're kind of like carbon right now, and to be at that level, you need to be diamond. So um, when I heard that, and when I share this story with many kids, when I do come to schools and I share my story, I always ask the class or the crowd, like, how many of you would have given up by this point? And I'm so sad that 95% of them do actually raise their hands. Um, but but for me, when I heard that response, I was so euphoric because the answer was not a no. And, and so I went back to the owner of the academy. Uh, he used to be top 10 in the world for singles, number two in the world for doubles. His sister was number one, um, Arantxa Sanchez Picario, and it was the Sanchez Casal Tennis Academy. And, and so a real tennis family. And I said to him, um, Emilio, uh, I, have, I have no money. But uh, I do know I have a degree, and I do know that I would like to stay here to train. So would you be able to give me that chance? And Emilio was very kind, and he did. And, and for the next one and a half years of my life, like I, I, I worked 12 to 15 hour shifts in kind to pay for my, my training. I told Emilio, like, I don't care whether 
I'm washing your dishes for you, I can clean your toilets for you, like whatever just for the chance to stay here and, and train. And that's how I started my tennis journey. So after a year and a half, I pushed my, my game to a level where I could not work 12 to 15 hour shifts and uh, at a pace of six days a week if I wanted to play, start playing a high level of, of tournaments. Um, my conundrum then was that I didn't have money or avenues to uh, explore the next level. So, but what did come of that was a chance to come back home to Singapore and work for um, the Singapore Sports Council back then, now called Sports Singapore. And uh, I was given the chance to train and compete and get a salary at the same time. So I, I came back and I worked and it was very special because it was three years spent in an environment where everyone loved sport, loved sport, and, and it was um, a chance to really see how we administer sport to our country and the role that sport plays to bettering our society and, and bettering you know, the people that we serve. It's one thing to be called a, a, a high performance athlete and that's what um, we do at the level of our sport. We perform to the highest level possible uh, that we can within ourselves and, and for our countries. But it's a different thing to be called a, a national athlete. It's like when you're called a national athlete, you are called to serve your nation through your sport. And that's something at my time at Sports Singapore and also um, in my time now as a professional full-time athlete, that gives me the chance to do. I, I realize that being called a national athlete gives you the chance to really use your sport to, to build people up and to help them find through the vehicle of your journey the highest, strongest versions of themselves. And, and it's, a, it's a responsibility and a, and a blessing and a calling that, that I take Seriously, and I'm very grateful every day for us 29, and I realized that if I did not do it now, if I did not try my hand and, and pay credit to the past 10 years of work that I've been doing towards this goal of playing full time and with one day making the WTA, I would never. So, so I, I quit my Sports Singapore job and with the blessings of, of my bosses, <laughs> uh, left the office and then decided to play uh, full-time. So my boss said, yeah, just do it and, and just see how... I told him I'm going to jump and I don't know what's going to catch me beneath. And I mean, in the Singaporean context, no one really does stuff like this, um, much less, you know, try to be an independent athlete in a sport that no one has really set, set real precedents for. And, and he said, you know, when you jump and you know you have no safety net or no, no string to pull you back, that's where you you make sure that you really make the leap. So, so I turned full time and, and I had still not sorted out my funding. I had only six months worth of savings to see me through. Um, I, didn't, I had a coach that I was working with. I had um, started the tour a very little bit. I was still trying to find my way. And I was at, the point, at that point, I realized that I had to share the weight of my journey. The thing about many Singaporean athletes is that they they train so hard and they have aspirations that they hold so deep in their hearts, but so few people hear about those stories. And, and I come back to the point of why we are even called national athletes in the first place. When people don't get the chance to hear your story, you don't really fulfill the purpose that your sport gives you the platform to do, which is to serve people through your sport and inspire others to go rise up, take up your own mountain, take up your own mantle and go run to the highest possible, strongest possible version of yourself. So, so I did that and um, turned full-time. And, and it was beautiful because in those first six months of, of being a, a full-time professional athlete, um, still looking for funding, I shared my story with a friend who uh, wrote a very small um, um, editorial, online editorial, and I said, can I share my story through your platform? And she did, and the story ended up viral uh, within Singapore, within the tennis community for sure. And, and that's how it started the onset of many more things to come. Um, at the end of my first year uh, on tour, I was the first Singaporean to ever run a crowdfunding campaign uh, to fund tour. And, and from that, I had gained support and traction from people from all walks of life. And I was really terrified because the cost of living is high in Singapore. Tennis, in general, is an extremely expensive sport. Uh, and it was always 
a challenge to come against those barriers and find solutions to them in spite of. And I was petrified when I, when I shared my story and I uh, showed my first crowdfunding campaign video because I didn't know how the universe would respond. I didn't know whether I'd be dragged through the mud with criticisms and skepticisms of who the hell does she think she is, you know. She's already, what, 29 and she wants to play and one day be on the WTA rankings, like, hello, you know, it's reality check. And, um, but I just told myself, you know, if, if, even if there are 10 critics out there, and sometimes we can be our own worst critic, and we're so sensitive to the voices of others, said and unsaid. And I told myself, no, Sarah, like, what is the purpose and what is my, my journey in service of? And I told myself, you know, even if there are 10 critics out there, if my story can inspire just one, I'll do it. I'll do it. It's worth it. The tears, the, the heartache, the, the moments of being human and valuable are worth it for the point of being able to strengthen the other person out there. I don't know who or she, he or she may be, but I think it's worth it. So I did my crowdfunding campaign, raised enough money to barely scraped me through one year of tour. Uh, this is my fifth year out on tour. Years two and three were extremely difficult because uh, two years in a row, I came one point short of making ranking on the WTA doubles rankings. And I ran out of funding and so had to restart again from zero and zero and zero again because our points on the WTA calendar uh, only last for 52 weeks at a go. So uh, if you do not have the chance to consistently compete, then you do not have the chance to maintain your ranking or break through the rankings. Um, so, so that's happened and, and it, I have low moments include, you know, being down to <laughs> $1.87 in my bank account and seeing that on my phone, on the bus, on the way home from practice and just breaking out and just, just feeling really terrible. I had to sit underneath my void deck and, and and clear everything out and cry and it's not falling down my face and I was just feeling terrible but you know what was beautiful is that even in low moments like that like I knew deep in my heart that I was exactly where I was meant to be I was meant to go through that that difficult period so that it would make me stronger so it would give me that deeper resolve of why I was doing what I was doing so TWA is a, is a very um, heavy endeavor. And for four years, I traveled without a team and without a coach because that was the most working capital I could raise to do TWA. And in my fourth year, at the end of my fourth year, um, I, I approached, I, I knew I had been constantly looking for a coach to work with on TWA. I would come off matches in those four years thinking to myself, like, I don't understand what just went wrong. And it's not for want of lack of ability or capacity. It was just for want of lack of resource to actually have a pair of eyes there watching you play. And when you come off court to help you break down what happened in the match so that you could do better. So at the end of my fourth year, I approached, um, uh, I've been observing a number of team setups. The coaches that I wanted to bring with me on tour, I could never raise the working capital to, to bring with me on. So. I had to look at existing setups on tour, and I approached this coach with his girl, and I ended up sharing the cost of this coach with three other girls, and I had a coach with me for this year, 2019. And I think if we look at the, the length of my journey, that was the biggest change in my setup. I actually had a coach to work with on tour. And even though I had to share him with, with, with a bunch of other girls, the fact of having a pair of eyes on you on tour, on the court, we had planned to make ranking by the end of 2019. 2019. And uh, we did that with, in, within half that time, just sharing one coach. So with just diluted ratios, I, was, I managed to make this tremendous shift. And people do ask me, who are not familiar with the tennis world, what does making WTA ranking really mean? What's, how significant is it? The world tennis structure is f made up of two circuits. The World Tennis Tour, which is run by the International Tennis Federation, and there is the ATP or the WTA Tour. The WTA Tour is the Women's Tennis Association Tour, and that's where um, the highest and the best tennis players, female tennis players in the world play. 
And then there is the ATP Tour, which is the Association of Tennis Professionals. That's where you see the Roger Federer's, the Nadal's, the Djokovic's of the world. So when you play, uh, for any tennis player who plays, their dream is always to make WTA ranking. You can make that on the World Tour and you move up towards playing the WTA Tour. And within the structure of players who play competitively, only 15 to 18% of players actually possess that coveted WTA or ATP ranking. Uh, most of the players, however, within this triangle form, uh, have ranking for a long time. That means they play consistently, they possess that ranking, they hold on to their ranking. However, if you look at the statistics of players that actually break through into the WTA rankings per year, it is only a very humble 1%. So this year, after having engaged a coach and having made plans to try and make ranking by the end of the year, the chance to work with a team on tour um, helped me make ranking in half that time, and I broke into that 1%. Uh, the beautiful thing about having made WTA ranking was from the fact that this journey, from the highs to the lows to fundraising to getting support and seeking for support, was the fact that making ranking was a product purely backed by the people. It came from everyone, from a security uncle who earns $800 a month, taking $10 out of his pocket and giving it to me and going, here girl, go chase your dreams to the corporate lawyer who gave me $100, to the local com Singaporean company who gave me $10,000. And all these people combined in the efforts of so many um, gave me the wings and the ability to go out there and look for the best coaches in the world, some of the best coaches in the world, gave me the wings to, to travel the world and to compete and really get out there in the mud every day and to fight to be the best player that I could be.